morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our online worship for the 31st of January. Now, I don't know about you, but January seems to have flown by for me. Maybe it's because we're so busy at home with homeschooling and work and all sorts of things. But it's not such a bad thing when we're looking forward to the future that a month has gone quite quickly. In fact, I'm quite glad because it moves us a step closer towards what will hopefully be a safer and happier time. We begin, as we always do, with our reading for the watchword. And our Old Testament reading comes from 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 9. For with a single mind <clears throat> they had offered freely to the Lord, made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart. And our hymn verse is that wonderful Francis of Assisi, All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, O oh, praise him, O oh, praise him, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. The New Testament is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 7. God loves a cheerful giver. And a little thought. And according to Dr. Spooner, God gives a cheerful liver. Therefore, we live cheerfully. I love Spoonerisms. Uh, I had a teacher at school, uh, Mr. Pollard, who was my form teacher. He was a great, uh, funny and kind man. And he used to do Spoonerisms all the time. Um, so I, I love a spoonerism. So instead of uh, God loves a cheerful giver, God gives a cheerful liver. I like that. Therefore we live cheerfully. In our prayers for the coming week, we're asked to remember the brothers and sisters of the Harold Road congregation and that of their minister, Sister Christine Emmanuel. Our first hymn will see us bringing praise to the Lord as we sing, Lift Up Your Hearts. Comfort and support. For those who have 
made a phone call, made a visit, brought us food, or done anything that even though it might seem on the face of it a small gesture has meant the world to us. We thank you for your messengers of hope. We know, Lord, that it is difficult sometimes to keep our spirits up. But we pray that you keep sending those messages of hope so that we can fill, be filled with your spirit and move forward. We acknowledge all the pain that we have felt and that has been felt by those around us. As we acknowledge the deaths of over a hundred thousand people from COVID over this last, not even a year. Every single one of those lives lost leaves a family torn and grieving. We pray for your support and your love to be outpoured unto all the pain and the anguish that has been felt and that is being felt. Send your spirit of love and compassion and may we in all we do bring love and hope to the hopeless. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who through his actions and his sacrifice showed us that nothing is impossible for you and that we need never give up on hope. Lord, we thank you that his sacrifice was not in vain and that because of his love of you and his love of us, we have a new covenant forged in forgiveness and we know you more closely we know you more deeply we know you more personally than has ever been felt before but lord we acknowledge that we are all sinners in our various ways and forms we have fallen short of the grace that was offered freely by you. And we ask that you forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, if we have been too slow to help and to reach out. If we have let our thoughts of this world, our preoccupation with the busyness of life, prevent us from reaching out to those in need. Refill and refuel us in your spirit to be the beacons of light that you would have us be. Forgive us, gracious God, and restore us unto you. For this we ask through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We say together the prayer that Jesus taught us to say when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. We will now hear our readings from Scripture. Our Old Testament reading comes from Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your great reward. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me? Since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, and so a servant in my household will be my heir. 
Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord, who brought you out of earth, of the children, to give you this land, to take possession of it. But Abraham said, O oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I shall gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought, brought all of those these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not put in half. The birds of prey came down on the carcass, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And the Lord said to him, No, for certain, that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated for four hundred years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, to your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euripides, the land of the Kenites, the Kenzinites, the Kadmonites, Hittites, Prezites, Raphaelites, Amorites, Canaanites, Grigishites, and Jebusites. This is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. And it's easy for me to say. We now hand over to Sister Sonia, who is going to read us our New Testament reading. Good morning, Church. Today's reading is taken from Mark 1, verses 21 to 28. Jesus drives out an evil spirit. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority not as teachers of the law. Just then a man in the synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they each they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. We are going to sing a wonderful hymn now called God's Spirit is Deep in My Heart. It's based on the reading from Mark's Gospel and it has the wonderful chorus that he sent me to bring the good news to the poor. Now it is a bit of fun, it's a fun hymn and I remember a couple of years ago when I played this at Synod, uh, we had a couple of German uh, guests, I, I'm afraid I'm deeply ashamed because I can't remember what her name was, but Jill, Jill, Jill Volt, but, uh, yes that was her. And she said to me, after I finished playing this on, on the piano, she said, I felt like I was in a, a Bavarian beer hall. She said, no, I wanted to be swaying along. So uh, listen, if you, when, you, when you're singing this hymn, I want you to, to enjoy yourself. And because God gives us good news, emphasis on the good, we should enjoy and enjoy what we can. 
uh, when we can. So let's have a little bit of fun and sing this beautiful and fun hymn, God's Spirit is Deep in My Heart. God's Spirit is deep in my heart He has called me and set me apart And this is what I have to do What I have to do He sent me to give the good news to the poor Tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more Tell blind people I'm sending you out to be my witnesses throughout the world, the whole of the world. He sent me to give the good news to the poor, tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more, tell blind people that they can school for him to go to 
was because of their Christian ethos. It really is a, a, a huge part of, of their learning. And it, to be honest, it, it wasn't something that I really was massively prioritising when we were looking at schools. Um, I just wanted the best school for him. Um, but when I, when we, sorry, when we went to go and see the school, um, they talked a lot about how important their faith is um, and how they were more interested in developing children who would be good human beings, uh, well-rounded individuals than academics. And, and that appeals right to my heart. If, if, if Edward ends up with no degrees or 10 degrees, so long as he's a decent person, which I'm sure he will be, that's the most important thing. So as part of that, they have different uh, themes that they touch on uh, as part of their Christian values. And at the moment, quite appropriately, their Christian value is about hope. They had an assembly on Monday, obviously on Zoom, uh, where the head teacher spoke about hope and how hope is an important thing to have as Christians. Um, and of course, they were asked, what do they hope for? It will come as no surprise to you or to I or anyone that the thing most of them, and especially Edward, hoped for was for the virus to go away. It's been very difficult for everyone. But I feel that the effect that it has had on children has been somewhat slightly overplayed. We're very lucky that both our children have adapted well uh, to this new norm, I hate that expression, but there you go, and have adapted to being at home well and we're doing okay with the homeschooling side of things, touching wood as I say it. Um, but I know that that's not the case for many children. Many children are really struggling uh, with the lack of routine. Many children don't have access to the internet freely and easily. You know, we, with families with many children that don't have access each for them to be able to do their work. It's a really difficult time. And so, the message of hope is crucial. As Christians, we are people of hope. We are people who should live in hope. Whenever I think about hope, I think about one expression that Archbishop Desmond Tutu used. He was asked about how he kept going during the apartheid Depression and, and how he kept going through the, the many challenges that he faced. And he used this expression, he said, I am a prisoner of hope. A prisoner of hope. He simply had no option but to hope. He was trapped by hope, if you like. But not trapped by hope is not a bad thing. It's become such a part of who he was and is uh, that hope was so crucial and it's just a part of who he was. So we should all be prisoners of hope. There should be no escaping hope. See, the message of the Bible is a message of hope. It's a message of redemption and salvation and hope for all people. And hope is a thing that is very difficult sometimes. And hope is a thing that sometimes takes a lot of time. Let's take a moment to look at Abraham, or Abram as he is in our readings. See, Abram is promised that he will have tons of descendants. And I cannot stress how important it is in this world, in this time, to have descendants. It was your legacy. 
Despite the fact that he and Sarai were promised to have many children, time went by. Many things happened, and yet still no children. Then we get to chapter 15, where God has to feel, really has to sort of reiterate the covenant. And the Lord says to him, do not be afraid, Abraham, I am your shield, your very great reward. But, but Abraham says, look, you, you, you say this, and I'm great, wonderful, thank you, but I, I still don't have any kids with Sarah. I have a, a child from a slave girl that that doesn't really mean anything. Harsh but true in the time. We've got to put things in the context, remember, brothers and sisters. So, when will it still happen? See, Abraham has started to doubt. But the thing is, Things don't happen on our time. They don't happen when we want them to. They happen on God's time, God's schedule, and when God feels it is right. So the Lord reiterates his covenant, and shortly after this, then they do indeed have a child. But still time passes between that reiteration of the promise and before the actual birth of Isaac. Why well, hope can be a challenging thing sometimes? Because we have to cling to it for a long time. I started off today by saying how fast the month of January has gone and how glad that I am that it's gone fast because it moves us closer and closer. It feels like we're running a marathon. I don't know what it's like to run a marathon, but I imagine it's what it feels like to run a marathon. And we are slowly starting to see the finish line, but we're tired. We've already run. 25 miles. We've got the last mile to go, but the last mile is the most painful one because we are bearing the burden, we are bearing the pain, the injury, the damage of all the other miles that have led us to this point. So the last stretch feels like longer than it's done, the whole, longer than the whole thing, but it is still the last stretch. It is still the final home straight. God's promises do always come true. But sometimes we have to wait. But the hope that is offered by God is an incredible hope that is offered to all people. See, we go back to Mark's Gospel. If you remember last week, brothers and sisters, and if you don't, you can always pause us and go back. I talked about Mark's Gospel and how Mark writes at an incredible pace. It's always immediately, then something else, then, then, and then, and then, and then. As we're hurtling towards, Mark is trying to cram as much information in as possible. But we've just got Jesus calling his first disciples, and then, not even another chapter later, literally the next verse after they, uh, after James and and um, James and his brother John, sorry, uh, left Zebedee, or they left him in the boat, and then they followed him. Just after that, we get Jesus starting his ministry. He's drawn his team together, and now he begins. And he begins in a, a very traditional sort of way, really. He begins in a temple, in a synagogue, on the Sabbath. And he 
began to teach. There's been thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of preachers, of prophets, of missionaries, evangelists. There's only ever been one Christ. See, even before him, there had been thousands and thousands of rabbis and priests and teachers of the law. But as Jesus begins to speak, the people are amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one having authority, not as the teachers of the law. Think about that for a moment. You're a teacher, you, you try your best to do everything you can to get the message across, you, you preach, you, you do all those sorts of things, and then Jesus comes along and does things so differently, so powerfully. He teaches with one as one with authority. Mark doesn't tell us what he actually said, but he tells us the impact. The impact is that they are amazed and they converse and they talk and they are so amazed. But then something else happened. You see, having authority means being about practicing what you preach. You know, it's, not, it's all very well and good standing there saying, do this, do that, and the other. But if you're not doing it, you're a hypocrite. Jesus gives a message of hope. You would assume. Because he then acts upon it. The, is a man in the synagogue possessed by an evil spirit who calls out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Nobody else knew that. Nobody else in the synagogue knew that or even thought or suspected that could be true. But the demon did. The evil spirit knew who he was. Be quiet, Jesus said, come out of him. And the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him. So not only there has Jesus proven himself to be an amazing speaker and a man who speaks and preaches with authority, he also practices with authority. What is this? people say. A new teaching and with authority. He gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. And because of this, because of what he said, because of what he did, news about him spread quickly over the whole region. Jesus stands there in a position of authority and his first action is to deliver the law, to give a message. His second action is to act upon that message and to give hope and healing to one most desperately in need. Of course, the impact is felt. We are in desperate need of hope. But in order to bring about hope, in order to bring about a brighter future, we have to be active parts of that. We have to be active in the movement of hope. 
Recently, Amanda Gorman read a poem that she had written called The Hill We Climb at the inauguration of President Joe Biden. I'm going to play that for you now. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace in the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change 
our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze-pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the wind-swept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked South. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Wow. How's that for a national debut? Most of us will remember where we were when we heard Joe Biden take the oath of office, give his inaugural address. We will all remember when we heard Amanda Gorman speak to the world as America's first national Thank youth poet laureate. Amanda Gorman. I want you to think about that last line. There is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. We have to be people of hope and try as hard as it can be to see the hope. We have to see the light, but not only do we have to see the light, we have to be the light. Not only do we have to see the hope, we have to be hope. We have to be people with authority that practices what we preach, that reaches out and helps and offers hope and comfort to those most desperately in need. So today, have hope. Have hope that the time will come when the virus is gone and we're able to be together and it becomes a mark of time, something that people write about in history books. But let us never lose the lessons. Let us be people of hope. Let us be people of light, so that all may come and see the light of Christ and the hope that comes from God. This is my prayer to you and to all. Be the light the world needs to see. Amen. Our final our final hymn is a hymn of dedication and of service. As we think about how we can be the light, dedicate our lives to God's service by saying, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Oh 
Thank you once again for joining us in our worship. We'll be back same time next uh, next week. And uh, I offer you now this final blessing. Lord, as we seek out the light, we pray that you help us to see your hope in this world and to be the hope, to be the light. May you equip us, commissioners and leaders out, out into the world to be ye beacons of hope in a hopeless time. And for this we pray. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore.